Chapter 18, The Kitchen, Part 1. The time has come, my grandmother said. The great moment has arrived. Are you ready, my darling? It was exactly half past seven. Bruno was in the bowl, finishing that fourth banana. Hang on, he said. Just a few more bites. No, my grandmother said. We've got to go. She picked him up and held him tight in her hand. She was very tense and nervous. I'd never seen her like that before. I'm going to put you both in my handbag now, she said, or I shall leave the clasp undone. She popped Bruno into it first. I waited, clutching the little bottle to my chest. Now you, she said. She picked me up and gave me a big kiss on the nose. Good luck, my darling. Oh, by the way, you do realise you've got a tail, don't you? A what? I said. A tail, a long, curly tail. I must say that never occurred to me, I said. Good gracious me, so I have. I can see it now. I can actually move it. It is rather grand, isn't it? I mention it only because it might come in useful when you're climbing about in the kitchen, my grandmother said. You can curl it around and you can hook it onto things and you can swing from it and lower yourself to the ground from high places. I wish I'd known this before, I said. I could have practised using it. Too late now, my grandmother said. We've got to go. She popped me into her handbag with Bruno and at once... I took up my usual perch in the small side pocket so that I could pipe my head out and see what was going on. My grandmother picked up her walking stick and out she went into the corridor to the lift. She pressed the button and the lift came up and she got in. There was no one in there with us. Listen, she said, I won't be able to talk to you much once we're in the dining room. If I do, people will think I'm dotty and talking to myself. The lift reached the ground floor and stopped with a jerk. My grandmother walked out of it and crossed the lobby of the hotel and entered the dining room. It was a huge room with gold decorations on the ceiling and big mirrors around the walls. The regular guests always had their tables reserved for them and most of them were already in their places and starting to eat their suppers. Waiters were buzzing about all over the place, carrying plates and dishes. Our table was a small one beside the right-hand wall, about halfway down the room. My grandmother made her way to it and sat down. Peeping out of the handbag, I could see in the very centre of the room two long tables that were not yet occupied. Each of them carried a notice fixed onto a sort of silver stick and the notice said, Reserved for members of the RSPCC. My grandmother looked towards the long tables but said nothing. She unfolded a napkin and spread it over her handbag onto her lap. Her hand slid under the napkin and took hold of me gently. With the napkin covering me, she lifted me up close to her face and whispered, I am about to put you onto the floor under the table. The tablecloth reaches almost to the ground so no one will see you. Have you got hold of the bottle? Yes, I whispered back. I'm ready, Grandmama. Just then, a waiter in a black suit came and stood by our table. I could see his legs from under the napkin and as soon as I heard his voice, I knew who he was. His name was William. Good evening, madam. He said to my grandmother, where is the little gentleman tonight? He's not feeling very well, my grandmother said. He's staying in his room tonight. I'm sorry to hear that, William said. Today there is green pea soup to start with and for the main course you have a choice of either grilled fillet of sour or roast lamb. Pea soup and lamb for me, please, my grandmother said. But don't hurry it, William. I'm in no rush tonight. In fact, you can bring me a nice glass of dry sherry first. Of course, madam, William said, and he went away. My grandmother pretended she had dropped something, and as she bent down, she slid me out from beneath under the napkin and onto the floor under the table. Go, darling, go, she whispered. Then she straightened up again. I was on my own now. I stood clasping the little bottle. I knew exactly, exactly where the door into the kitchen was. I had to go about halfway around the enormous dining room to reach it. Here goes, I thought, and like a flash, I skittled out from under the table and made for the wall. I had no intention of going across the dining room floor. It was far too risky. My plan was to cling close to the skirting of the wall all the way around until I reached the kitchen door. I ran Oh, how I ran. I don't think anyone saw me. They were all too busy eating. But to reach the door leading to the kitchen, I had to cross the main entrance to the dining room. I was just about to do this when in poured a great flood of females. I pressed myself against the wall, clutching the bottle. 
At first I saw only the shoes and ankles of these women who were surging in through the door, but when I glanced up a bit higher, I knew at once who they were. They were the witches coming in to dinner. I waited until they had all passed me by. Then I dashed on towards the kitchen door. The waiter around it to go in. I nipped in after him and hid behind a big garbage bin on the floor. I stayed there for several minutes, just listening to all the talk and the racket. By golly, what a place that kitchen was. The noise and the steam and the clatter of pots and pans and the cooks all shouting and the waiters all rushing in and out from the dining room yelling the food orders to the cooks. Four soups and two lambs and two fish for table 28. Three apple pies and two strawberry ice creams for number 17. Stuff like that going on all the time. Not far above my head there was a handle sticking out from the side of the garbage bin. Still clutching the bottle, I gave a leap, turned a somersault in the air and caught hold of the handle with the other end of my tail. Suddenly, there I was swinging to and fro upside down. It was terrific. I loved it. This, I told myself, is how a trapeze artist in a circus must feel as he goes swishing through the air high up in the circus tent. The only difference was that his trapeze could only swing backwards and forwards, but my trapeze, my tail, could swing me in any direction I wanted. Perhaps I would become a circus mouse after all. Just then a waiter came in with a plate in his hand and I heard him saying, The old lady on table 14 says this meat is too tough. She wants another portion. One of the cooks said, Give me a plate. I dropped to the floor and peeked round the garbage bin. I saw the cook scrape the meat off the plate and slap another bit on. Then he said, Come on boys, give us some gravy. He carried the plate round to everyone in the kitchen and do you know what they did? Every one of those cooks and kitchen boys spat onto the old lady's place. See how she likes it now, said the cook, handing the plate back to the waiter. Quite soon, another waiter came in and he shouted, Everyone in the big RSPCC party wants the soup. That's when I started sitting up and taking notice. I was all ears now. I edged a bit further round the garbage bin so that I could see everything that was going on in the kitchen. A man with a tall white hat, who must have been the head chef, shouted, Put the soup for the big party in the largest silver soup tureen. I saw the head chef place a huge silver basin onto the wooden side bench that ran along the whole length of the kitchen against the opposite wall. Into that silver basin is where the soup is going, I told myself. So that's where this stuff in my little bottle must go as well. Part two soon. Bye.